Welcome to Kevin Dill Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. On today's episode, we're going to be doing the long-term review of the Fuji X-H2. I'm pleased to announce that I'm launching three Capture One style packs, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder. These will eventually also be available for Lightroom, so if you go to kevindealphotography.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and join my mailing list, I promise I won't send you spam, but I will let you know the second these release. And now, on to today's episode. my journey through photography, I've evolved. In my quest to get the best image quality, I've always gone bigger and better. But the game is changing. Cameras are getting smaller. Optics are getting better. Sensors are getting more powerful. And as someone who has lugged around gargantuan 1.2 lenses on full frame bodies and paid the price dearly in the form of tennis elbow, it's caused me to step back and reevaluate my day to day camera system. Do we live in a golden era for APS C sensors? Is it getting harder and harder to tell the difference between APS C and full frame? The attraction of a smaller footprint drew me in. Well, that and those Fuji colors. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews, tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button button below. So if you watch this channel, you know that I shoot on both Canon and Fuji. And when I did my Canon R7 review, it was at the time the largest megapixel APS-C camera on the market. However, in late 2022, the Fuji X-H2 came out and it took over the title for the largest megapixel camera in APS-C. This was appealing to me because at that time, I was already shooting on Fuji and I really loved the look of Fuji, but there were some things that uh, left something to be desired and it was mainly in autofocus. So Fuji announced that they uh, upgraded the autofocus on both the X-H2 and the X-H2S and that got me to pull the trigger because uh, as I was shooting a bunch on my R5, it's a very heavy system and the lenses are super heavy. And sometimes I just wanna go shoot a model out in the streets, uh, you know, do a little bit of portfolio work and I don't need my big heavy lenses. And Fuji does an admirable job in those areas and I wanted a smaller and more compact setup. So in walked the X-H2 into my life and there are some areas where it has absolutely taken it over. And 
Maybe, just maybe, at the end of this video, I may declare that I'm more of a Fuji person now than I am a Canon person. So stick around on that and I'll make a determination. Now, because this is a long-term review, it's not the real world type of review that I normally do where you see me go test it out for a vacation and then you see me go test it out on portraits and then I go run it through a bunch of tests and all that. That is not how my long-term reviews work. My long-term reviews are I sit back I look at what I've done with the camera, I go through the specs that it announced that some of them look great on paper, and then I see how much of that stuff on paper actually translated to something positive for me, and then I see if maybe it didn't pan out the way I thought it would. That's how we're gonna dive into this. Let's start with the 40 megapixel APS-C X Trans BSI sensor. Fuji is well known for their colors and that is what got me off my butt to go out and purchase Fuji in the first place. Uh, to me, I shoot Fuji for my personal work. And by personal work, I don't mean like, oh, a family vacation or something like that or a piano recital. I shoot my book, my portfolio, majority of it with Fuji. And the reason why is because the colors are just so inspiring and I shoot on film. And of course you can guess why I am attracted to Fuji because I'm a film shooter. And those beautiful colors, they're not necessarily accurate, they're artistic. And that's what I love about it. I personally like to shoot photography to not see things as so surgical and realistic when I can. And on my personal book, that's exactly what I'm attracted to. It's also why I shoot on the Fuji GFX system. I'm not gonna say that this camera is as good as my GFX, it's nowhere close, but it does get you in the ballpark, the X-H2. I'm gonna just say that right off the bat. This uh, sensor is awesome. I primarily shoot Canon for my commercial work because oftentimes when I'm carrying out somebody's vision, they want things to look accurate. They want the clothing to look accurate and the autofocus needs to be perfect or at least have a super high hit rate, which uh, we'll get into Fuji later as to whether or not I think it has a super high hit rate and what I consider a super high hit rate, but let's stay on the sensor. 40 megapixels, that's plenty. You can be a commercial photographer. You can have clients that want to crop things 20 different ways. 40 megapixels will get you through that. You can print out gigantic prints at 40 megapixels. So I don't really think that there's a limitation there at being 40. My R5 is only 45. It's only five megapixels more. And then my Fuji GFX 100S, yes, it's a 100 megapixel sensor, but I don't really have that sensor for the megapixels as much as I do for the dynamic range. The dynamic range on that is insane. And I will do a long-term review of that camera at a later date as well. But let's get back to the X-H2. And I, I just, like I said, I love the sensor. I love the film simulations. And the reason why I gravitate toward Fuji for my book is because I don't like to do a lot of post-production work. And I find that most of the film simulations will get me kind of a closer starting point to where I want to be. And therefore I'm now closer to my finished product. And that is what attracts me to the X-H2 and that beautiful X-Trans sensor. Uh, in terms of speed, it, it, just like my Canon R5, it runs off a type B USB express card and then an SD card as the backup card. And uh, yeah, it does a pretty good job in terms of speed there, in terms of frames per second. I personally don't shoot Fuji for like wildlife and sports, but 15 frames per second should get you there. 20 frames per second, an electronic shutter will get you a little closer, but of course, keep in mind with electronic shutter, you will get warping for fast lateral moving objects. But another thing I love about the uh, top shutter speed on this, I have shot well above the maximum mechanical shutter speed. As you can see in this example right here of Misha, uh, I'll put the shutter speed below, but it was super high in the middle of the day, sh shooting wide open at 1.2 with that Viltrox 75 1.2 lens. In terms of ergonomics, uh, I do like the layout of the Fuji X-H2. It's pretty good to get around. I wish it had a few more buttons up in the thumb area on Canon. I actually prefer to have a couple buttons up here for my autofocus to go between eye detect and um, continuous and single point. They call that servo uh, on, on Canon. And 
I don't get that on the Fuji X-H2, but the ergonomics, I can live with them. Uh, there are other cool things. I like the fact that they have nice doors on the side. I like the fact that there's full-size HDMI ports. I love the, the build layout. As far as durability, um, I did take my X-H2 out in a downpour and it died. So I had to send it off the Fuji. Uh, that is 100% my fault, but when something says that it's weather sealed, I don't really worry about that much and I've been spoiled. I take my Canon R5 as well as my Canon R7 into downpours. I've taken my old Canon 6D out into downpours. None of them have ever had an issue. And the very first time I took my X-H2 out into a downpour, it turned into a paperweight. So, uh, just my anecdotal evidence, my experience, Fuji is not as well built as Canon in terms of weather sealing and this and that. However, I feel like if maybe I dropped it, which thankfully I haven't, I would probably be okay. But uh, I think it's durable enough for a $2,000 camera, but I don't think it's nearly as durable as Canon. And so uh, that's something uh, hopefully in a new version of the X-H2, maybe we can see a little bit of an improvement there. Uh, but it's not quite there in terms of being a professional camera, in my opinion. I'm sure some of you watching this are like, look, man, I take mine into downpours. I've seen images of people take theirs into sub-zero temperatures where the camera's frozen and all that. I'm not discounting your experiences. I'm simply commenting on mine. In terms of customizations and layout, like I said, the buttons are pretty cool. You can program most things the way you want to, but Fuji does do some kind of boneheaded things. Like if you want to format your card, I mean, they do have a shortcut on here, but you have to go into your user setting and then you have to go into your format and then you have to select which card you want to format. So there's like five button presses to format the card uh, if you're doing it within the menus. There's no greater example of poorly thought out menus than having to save your seven custom shooting modes under image quality. That's where you pick your film simulations. That's where you bump up your clarity. That's not where you're going to save your custom shooting modes, but for whatever reason, that's where Fuji decided to put it. And then the menus themselves just have things that are kind of laid out oddly in them. In general, I don't like Fuji menus. To further expand upon why I don't like Fuji menus, oftentimes I find myself having to go six or seven pages down. I think that's a poorly designed menu. You should have the menus go left to right. Once you reach the bottom of a page, you go to the next tab over. But they are better than Sony menus and they're way better than Lumix menus, but none of them can touch Canon as far as I'm concerned. I think Canon still has the best menus in the business, but I mean, you learn. I learn the menus. I learn where things are, but I just don't like where Fuji puts them. I know a lot of you out there who are diehard Fujis think this is a large camera. This is not a large camera. It's the second smallest camera I own next to my other Fuji camera, my X-T20. So maybe for a Fuji camera, this is on the larger side on their APS-C but I don't really feel that it's that large of a camera. I take it all the time with their tiny little lenses. I'll go shoot street photography with it. I'll go take it on vacation. And at no point in time am I thinking, oh man, my arms are getting tired. So uh, I think that from a size standpoint, this is a small camera. Some things that I, I don't like about the camera, I think this camera isn't that great in the studio. I don't like the EVF, it gets weird and dim. And I'll switch between turning the preview, white balance and exposure on and off, I'll turn it off. And then that way I just want as bright of an image as possible. I switch between the natural view and the non-natural view. And I just can't sometimes in low lighting get this thing to perform the way I want it to. I put it in boost mode. I think that it would be better if Fuji would just make a better EVF that's better designed for studio use. Another thing that bugs me about this camera is that for $2,000, anytime I take a lens off, the sensor is exposed. And I don't like that. I think that they should do what Canon does. Uh, and I think Nikon is starting to do this in their nicer cameras, which is when you turn the camera on. So first and foremost, as you can see right here with my camera, there is no sensor. You don't see it because there's this little curtain in front of it. Now, when I turn the camera on, there you go, you can see it, it's exposed. When I turn it off a second later, it shuts down. And the only times I've ever actually exposed this sensor to the elements is when I demonstrate this feature on my YouTube videos. Whenever you change a lens, this is closed. You take your lens, you put it on, you turn the camera on, now the sensor is exposed. You turn it off, it'll turn off a second later. When you hear the click, you take this off, and look, there's a window over it. So. I would like to see Fuji do that, especially with their GFX line. There's no excuse for that. But I think that they should also do it like X-T5, X-H2, 
X-H2S. I think all three of those cameras should have a window that goes down over the sensor because I have found myself having to clean the sensor despite the fact that it's smaller than my other two sensors pretty regularly. Another thing that I have experienced with this camera is freezing. I don't have that issue with my Canon camera and sometimes I get freezing on my GFX, but I tend to get freezing more often with the X-H2 and it seems to be card specific. So when I use these Lexar cards, they do not play well with Fuji. And of course you're watching this like, well then stop using your Lexar cards. Well, I'll format these cards and I'll put them in my Canon camera and they work just fine. So it's something with Fuji and Lexar communicating with each other. I would love to see them get on the same page somehow, but I'll just be out there shooting uh, uh, some sort of a portrait session. And all of a sudden my autofocus will like peg to the right and then things won't work. It'll just freeze up. And so that's kind of annoying about it. Uh, I do like the fact though, that with Fuji, there are a ton of options out there for lenses, third-party lenses, native lenses, F2 lenses, F1.4 lenses, and F1.2 lenses. There's just a lot of really good lines of lenses. Um, talking again about the durability, uh, I find that with Fuji, these curved lines, they tend to just wear out very easily. And some of them are worn out from my fingers, not necessarily from bumping into things. So I would love to see Fuji make a better investment in their bodies, which, like I said, I've already turned this thing into a brick by getting it wet. And it just seems that the sides wear out rather easily on it. And so there's nothing, nothing positive to say about that, unfortunately. Now, the camera does have some excellent video features features, but admittedly, I still use Canon for that for various reasons. But if you are considering getting this camera for video, it has amazing features like 8K, it does ProRes, and I actually like to bake the film simulations right into my video. I don't even shoot log when I use this guy because I think that the results are fantastic. But let's have a conversation about autofocus. To me, the biggest area where Fuji just has to figure this out is autofocus. Uh, on my Canon cameras, if I take a thousand shots during a session, uh, at most I'll miss five. Sometimes I'll miss zero. I've done weddings where I've taken 2,000, 2,500 shots somewhere in there and I've missed zero shots throughout the day. That's how accurate Canon's autofocus is. With Fuji, I'd say it's one in 10 I miss, and that's a pretty high number in my opinion. Uh, when I'm shooting a model who's flow posing and I'm shooting at F8 and I miss their eyes, that's because something in the camera got confused because I could leave it in manual focus at F8 and they're moving around and I could click and hit them and whether they move a little forward or a little back, if I'm standing 20 feet back from them, they're still gonna be within that depth of field. And what I'm noticing that Fuji's autofocus does is it'll acquire something and then it'll just throw it out right as soon as I press the shutter release. And I've done research on this. I've seen really great channels like pal to tech show you how to use Fuji autofocus. And I try it all the different ways. I try it in single point. I try it in the continuous modes. I use the wide tracking. I use the more narrow boxes. I even go into the subject detect movement where you put it between like the cheetah and the guy running. Like I've tried all the different combinations and I still have about a 10% miss rate, which leads me to believe that it's a Fuji thing and that Fuji needs to go in and improve the algorithms of their autofocus. To me, Fuji's autofocus is about on par with what Canon and Sony were doing in 2017 or 2018, which doesn't suck, but it's not great either. Now, thankfully, because I use the X-H2, mainly for personal work, I can slow down and I can take my time. And if I miss something for my portfolio, well, I only have myself to hold responsible. However, for paying clients, you can't afford to miss, whether it's a special moment in a wedding or whether it's a campaign that you're shooting and you only have one shot to shoot something, you need to get it right. And I still shoot Canon in those instances because I can't afford to miss shots. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that kind of stuff. I know very successful wedding photographers who shoot on Fuji. Uh, I know very successful uh, photographers who shoot commercial who shoot on Fuji. I myself have shot commercial projects on Fuji. When a prospective client reaches out to me, I ask them, hey, go through my work, 
and find five to 10 pictures I've taken that you really like. And I do that not to stroke my ego, but I try to figure out what camera I was using because I shoot on multiple camera systems. And I try to get a little bit of cheating uh, as far as insight. It's like, oh, they really like it when I shoot on an 85 millimeter. They really like it when I shoot 35. I try to get as much insight as I can. And then that helps me determine which camera system I'm gonna use on a job. And recently, someone chose a bunch of shots that I took on my X-H2. So I decided to shoot a campaign on it. And you know what? It turned out great. I, I just wanna let you know that this camera absolutely can do those things, but that is at the expense of a perfect autofocusing system, which this does not have. And I would really like to see Fuji make an investment in better autofocus. Now, a lot of you watching this are like, dude, the autofocus is just fine. Maybe for what you do it is, but for me, I still think that there's a lot of room for improvement. So a year and a half in, what are my thoughts on the Fuji X-H2? Well, I'll tell you, it's become my favorite camera. Yes, I own a GFX 100S, but it has its problems and it's very slow to shoot. Yes, the results are better than all my other cameras. It is my best camera in terms of image quality, but it's not necessarily fun to use my Fuji GFX. My Canon, while super accurate and super fast, uh, the colors look very close to reality. It's a little more surgical. And to me, for my personal work, I find that to be rather boring. So for me, the compromise, I actually like using the X-H2 more than all my other cameras, despite its flaws, because its colors get me very close to what my GFX gives me. Uh, its accuracy is good enough, could be better. And then of course, the fact that it's just light and it's a pleasure to use. Uh, I'm really starting to love this camera. And I would say that this is the camera that's kind of pushed me over the edge to being more of a Fuji person now than a Canon person. Despite the fact that I make my most money off my Canon camera for my personal work, my love is here with Fuji. So should you buy this camera? Well, based off of my experiences, uh, yes, you're gonna run into some issues with the cards, you're gonna run into some issues with the autofocus, but in general, if you love those looks, those film simulation looks, and you don't necessarily need all those dials and you come over from Canon, you come over from Nikon or Sony, absolutely, I recommend this camera. Uh, I'm a PASM guy, I love the PASM dial. Uh, it gives me something unique and my work does stand out from a lot of my peers because they're all shooting on Sony and Canon and Nikon and Fuji, let's just be honest, has a slightly different look, especially when you're talking about skin tones. You use something like uh, classic chrome, the blues look amazing on there. I just can't get that stuff out of my Canon camera. I can go into post-production and tweak it, but I like to get stuff right at the camera. I don't like to spend a ton of time in Photoshop. So this is my current favorite overall camera, despite the fact that it does have its limitations. And so if you're in the market for one, I say buy it. It's a pretty cool camera. I do hope that they come out with a new version. And there is a part of me sometimes that wonders if I should have gone the X-H2S route because megapixels aren't everything. And that X-H2S is a little better in low light. Uh, and so that's something that's intriguing to me. And so we'll see if they come out with new versions of these cameras, maybe I'll go down in megapixels or maybe they'll just make a better version of the X-H2 that makes it worth it. That does it for today's episode. I thank each and every one of you for watching. How are you enjoying your X-H2? Are you on the fence about an X-H2? And did this review help you go in one direction or the other? Tell me about that in the comments below. And if you're a fan of this channel, I humbly ask you to click the subscribe button below. And lastly, if you are a fan of my style and you wanna hear my photography and videography related opinions in greater detail, I highly encourage you to check out my other YouTube channel, the F11 Photography Podcast. And if you can't check it out on YouTube and you just wanna to listen to my podcast, you can also find it on all major podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>